Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for inviting me to speak here today. Um, usually when I come to an event like this, I'm kind of hiding in the back of the room with my reporter's notebook, you know, and so it's kind of weird to be the center of attention. Um, and I recognize a lot of you here as people who I've en uh, interviewed in the past for different stories that I've written. Um, before I get into talking about green scene and reporting on environmental news, um, I wanted to share a little bit with you about what I was doing before I came to Asheville. Um, a little over three years ago, I was involved in an environmental campaign called Mountain Justice Summer, um, and that was uh, organized by a coalition of nonprofits that were working on the issue of mountaintop removal mining. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it. Um, throughout uh, southern West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, eastern Tennessee, um, mountains are just being completely leveled and ecosystems are being completely uh, decimated for coal extraction. Um, and here in the southeast, we're heavily dependent on on coal and nuclear energy as well for, um, for electricity. Um, the experience really showed me firsthand the heavy toll our national dependence on fossil fuels is taking in southern Appalachia and throughout this region. Um, and I met some people there who were planning to move to Asheville to work on environmental issues and decided to join them. And, and I knew I really wanted to focus on environmental stories um, through that experience. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, I moved to Asheville about three years ago, and I started writing Green Scene, which is um, the environmental news column in the Mountain Express. Um, and I'm actually preparing to leave Asheville now, as um, you know, I think was mentioned earlier, Friday's going to be my last day at the paper, and I'm relocating to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but I can tell you that you know, in three years, the community that, I, that I've encountered here, really I've found to be one of the most forward-thinking when it comes to embracing green solutions. Um, when I first started writing Green Scene, my editors wondered, is there really enough happening on the environmental front that we can offer something compelling every week? Um, and I can tell you that there's not enough space in Green Scene to really reflect what's going on. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of good news, um, obviously. Western North Carolina is rich in biodiversity. People come here because of the natural beauty. Um, there, it's also a hub for environmental activism. There are so many grassroots organizations, uh, nonprofits that are working on land conservation, um, promoting energy efficiency, um, and of course there's a network of green businesses. People are working on everything from developing um, biodiesel that's based on or that's made with algae to um, uh, non-toxic green building products. Uh, let's see. Sorry. <laughs> just a whole number of different um, green businesses. There's also a lot of bad news to report on, too. Um, we have, we're facing a lot of threats to our water quality um, from rapid development. Um, a lot of open space is being lost to sprawl and steep slope development, that kind of thing. And of course, as Drew was talking about earlier, there's some critical questions about, you know, as we go into the future, that's going to be characterized by climate change. Um, I guess writing Green scene has given me kind of a bird's eye view of uh, the environmental scene here in Asheville. Um, and I'd like to spend a few minutes spotlighting some efforts that are already underway promoting uh, sustainability. This guy looks familiar. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Southern Energy and Environment Expo, um, the eighth annual one was held just this past August. Um, that's an example of something that's linking together hundreds of green businesses, uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, and teaching people, you know, about low impact and alternative solutions. Um, the Ash Village Building Convergence, uh, the first one was held just this past spring, um, and it's tied together the efforts of a number of organizations that were looking at things like food, shelter, transportation, and other facets of, of daily life just through a sustainable lens. Um, even since I've been here, new programs have been starting up. I see Dwayne in the back there. Um, the Asheville Green Opportunity Corps is one that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, this is something that is, uh, sorry, <laughs> getting a little bit nervous here. The Green Opportunity Corps is um, linking youth from low-income neighborhoods with skills that they would need to work in the environmental sector. Um, and the success of this program would really depend on a network of local green businesses who are willing to hire apprentices and share their skills. Um, I view this as an example of integrating a push for sustainability with solutions to the very pressing issues of, of economic disparity in our region. Um, I feel like, 
you know, if sustainable solutions are only benefiting the upper class, then they're not really solutions. It has to be something that's integrating everyone. Um, a couple other things I wanted to highlight, Blue Ridge Forever uh, is a campaign to protect 50,000 acres of land in Western North Carolina. Um, it's linking the efforts of land trusts from 25 different counties. Um, Appalachian Offsets is the first locally based carbon offsets program that I've um, ever heard of, basically. And <laughs> which is a really good thing. Those programs can be kind of questionable, but uh, this is something that, that also relies on forging partnerships between businesses, nonprofits, local government agencies. Um, and some things that they're doing are, for instance, switching out incandescent light bulbs in public housing complexes with compact fluorescents, which are much more energy efficient. Um, Warren Wilson's new Insulate program is a new partnership that'll help people who are low-income homeowners to get the home repairs that they need uh, for better energy efficiency. Um, this is something that I feel like is really important because winter is coming, this kind of project can ease the burden of um, home e heating oil costs while also shrinking a household's carbon footprint. So these kinds of things are helping people while also you know, reducing our overall um, dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, Transition Town Asheville is a small group that's trying to hammer out sustainable approaches to food, transportation, energy, and other basic needs, and they're trying to envision a future of, you know, what if we weren't relying on fossil fuels? What would we use instead? Um, there's also a number of uh, programs that are trying to communicate these issues to the general public. And there's a lot. Um, there's Sustainable Asheville. Um, I, I've listed a few links. Oh, one of them got covered up, I guess. But <laughs> I listed a few links up here. And if you haven't seen these, um, you know, take a moment to check them out. Um, Sustainable WNC is kind of like the green version of, of the Mountain Area Information Network. Um, SustainableAsheville.org has a calendar of environmental events in the area. Um, Green Building Directory is something that's a collaboration between the Mountain Express and the Western North Carolina Green Building Council. Um, it's a directory of all the different green businesses in the, or I'm sorry, green builders in the area. Asheville Green Drinks is kind, kind of has a similar approach to Green Mondays, except there's beer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the local food guide tells you about different uh, local farmers, um, restaurants that are serving local foods, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on and there are a lot of efforts to try and get people talking to one another um, and sharing ideas. Uh, let's see. There's even a few others listed. I know Ian Booth was supposed to speak today about uh, Sustainable Now and the Green Radio Bistro. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot going on in terms of information sharing. Um, this is a photo from the Kenai Fjords National Park. Um, in, in Alaska. I was there this past August um, as part of a program with the Knight Center for Environmental Journalism to see the on-the-ground effects of climate change. Kind of like Drew's trip to Greenland. Um, we really had an opportunity to just go up to these glaciers and, and watch the ice just calve and fall into the ocean right before our eyes. It was very dramatic. Um, but, you know, this slide is just asking, is the point getting across, um, you know, Steve spoke earlier about preaching to the choir. Are we really communicating these issues effectively, um, you know, in terms of just how much weight it carries. Um, over here are some, some words of wisdom from David Orr, who's the professor, professor of environmental studies at Oberlin College. Um, I had an opportunity to take several classes with him when I was a student there. Um, and, you know, what he calls the, the great work ahead of us, in his words, is you know, not just something that'll help with economic development or make us feel good, you know, it's something that involves actually averting the effects of catastrophic climate change um, and making decisions that'll benefit people and protect biodiversity. Um, it's a tall order, um, but then, you know, if you think about the consequences of, um, you know, not trying, um, I don't think anybody here needs a reminder about the fact that we're in a drought um, the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an invasive pest that's taking a toll on our southern forests. Um, the gas crunch, uh, good example of a reliance on fossil fuels and what happens if there's a shortage. Um, there's a you know, slide there from uh, stormwater runoff and the effects on our local water quality. 
um, you know, these aren't issues that are just for the Sierra Club to care about. These are, these are major news stories and, and expensive problems. Um, and, you know, I guess looking back, um, I guess my one regret about Green Scene is that it's actually separating environmental news from the rest of the hard news that we're reporting uh, in our paper. And it kind of it has the potential to create the illusion that only environmentalists should really be interested. Um, I think, you know, if our bid to promote a sustainable future is going to be successful, people need to think about it as something that can benefit everyone and that can actually be employed to solve some really tough problems that we're facing. Um, so, you know, in closing, we've got lots of wonderful programs and ideas and initiatives in this area, and there's the potential to do a lot. So, I don't know if I took up the whole 10 minutes, but <laughs> thank you.